Thank you, Jan, and thank all of you for being here. This is really a, a, a privilege to be a part of this and to see it all come together. Uh, before we go in any further, I'm wanting to introduce to you uh, one of the people that I want you to connect with uh, along the way. Where's Don Wagner? Don Wagner is the program director for Friends of Seville. Stand up, Don, right over here. And uh, we're very grateful for his presence, and you'll want to meet with him along the way and, and offer to him your own suggestions on where to go from here and all that. Yes, it was in 1964. I went to the Church Divinity School of the Pacific, uh, and I met Naim Atik, and it was the first time I'd ever heard that there even was a Palestinian story. He told his story. I heard it for the first time. And he kept saying to me, come over and see. And I kept putting it off, but in 1983 I did. And I have to go back quite regularly in order to see more, learn more, and repair the ignorance that I have as an individual. So Justice is his middle name. Uh, and I am Justice Atik, and uh, we know him as he has found his way uh, in a thicket of, of uh, his own life experiences leading to what is Seville and liberation theology, and we welcome him to this moment in time that we may learn from you, Naim. Naim Atik. Thank you, Dick. Good morning. <laughs> it's good to be with you. I'm very excited uh, to be here. I thank God for all of you and for this uh, wonderful uh, time and for this conference. I want to thank God also uh, for the use of this church and for the organizing committee and all the friends that we have in this part of the country. Um, uh, it's, I want to begin by bringing greetings to all of you from your brothers and sisters who live in Palestine and in, in Israel. Uh, and um, I know they wanted to be remembered to you. Please hold them in your prayers. And we thank God for all those of you who have come to visit us a number of times. I know many of you are very dedicated and committed to this issue, and um, I, I really thank God for you. Um, we, we need to work together. It's very important. Um, and I think we, I, we, some of us feel that we are beginning to see the turn. There is a shift towards justice, and I think we will hear more about it in this, in this conference. So it's very exciting. We are living at a very exciting time. Now, one of, the, um, one of the big problems that we still face uh, has to do with the way some of our brothers and sisters in this country and in other parts of the world, uh, in the way they interpret the Bible, in the way they use the Bible. And, um, and this has been a cause of great concern for us because uh, we know that the Bible has been abused many times um, in the history of the church. We know that um, when we wanted to uh, legalize and legitimize uh, slavery, we found te text in the Bible to do that. And we know that we wanted to go to war, we went to the Bible and we found passages uh, from the Bible to, to justify our going to war. We know that when we wanted to silence women, we went to the Bible and we found text to do that. And I can go on and on in the way we have abused scripture. And, um, and the latest, probably one of the latest abuses of scripture is to use the scripture against the Palestinians and against the justice for the Palestinians. And I want to try to do it today in a Bible study uh, as, as briefly as I can 
uh, because we don't have very much time, and I hope I can do that. Um, but before I do this, I want to um, introduce Sabil. Now, I know many of you know Sabil, uh, but some of you are new. And again, very briefly, I just want to say, Sabil is an ecumenical organization started among Palestinian Christians um, in Palestine, in Jerusalem. At the time, I was parish priest at St. George's Cathedral in Jerusalem. And we used, we chose them the name Sabil. And the word Sabil is Arabic and has two meanings. One uh, means the way, and for us, the way, you can see it coming down from the foot of the cross. Um, we are on a journey, we're walking the way, uh, but it also means uh, a spring of water. And again, there is the water coming down. But although Sabil started within the Christian community, Sabil uh, is a very ecumenical one. So we work with the Jewish people, we work with the Muslims, we work with the people who are secular, uh, we work with all people who believe in the importance of justice and the importance of peace based on justice. And uh, Sabil now has friends throughout the world. We thank God for them. Most of them are doing the work voluntarily, uh, dedicated to a peace uh, for the Palestinians and the Israelis. Uh, and so we are very inclusive in our, in our work for justice and peace. So as you can see, I am rushing uh, because of the time factor. Uh, so I want to start the Bible study. Uh, and I hope if I cannot answer all the questions, at least I can somehow uh, raise your interest in this very important topic. Now, in last year, the Pew Research Foundation, the Pew Research Center, uh, conducted a survey. And in this survey, they asked Jewish people in this country whether God has given the land of Palestine or the land of Canaan or the way they had it, the land of Israel, to the Jewish people. But did God give this land to the Jewish people? And the net results, I have the chart, I have the, the statistics, but we don't have time to go into it. But the net Jewish response to this question was that 40% of Jews in this country said yes, God has given the land to the Jewish people. 27% said no, 5% said we don't know, and 28% said we don't believe in God. <laughs> what is very interesting is that we know back home that we're dealing with some atheist Jews, secular Jews, and sometimes we hear Jews say, we don't believe in God, but we know God gave us the land. So it's very interesting. <laughs> then the Pew survey asked the Christians in this country whether they believe that God gave the land to the Jewish people. And 44%, 44. Now, with the Jews, the Jewish response was 40%. With the Christians, they said 44%, yes. And 34% uh, of American Christians said uh, no. 5%, 11% said we don't know. And 11% said we don't believe in God. <laughs> now, as you can see, 40% of Jews saying God gave the land, 44% Christians saying God gave the land to the Jewish people. Today, this is one of our biggest issues facing us when we look at the Bible. How do we really understand 
the whole issue of the promise. I know it's a big topic. I wish I have several hours with you to go into details. But again, very briefly, I want to raise this issue before you. Uh, one of the probably representatives uh, of this type of more fundamentalist extremist position is a person by the name of Pat Robertson. So let's go in into that. Okay, I need to move from here. Yeah. Um, I can't see it very well. So, uh, so, so Pat Robertson says, I want to show you some scriptures from the Bible that talk about this. And there are literally dozens, dozens of them that God's promise to Abraham approximately 1800 years ago before Christ. Uh, okay, next, next one, please. Uh, I want to go to the second, second paragraph. So he says, this is a permanent possession given by God to Abraham. And all of this territory is the land of Israel. There is no such thing as a Palestine state, nor has there ever been. This is a mistake, but that's what he said. Uh, and then he and then if we ally ourselves with the enemies of Israel, we, we will be standing against God Almighty. So this is his view that we need as people of faith, in his perspective, to support Israel because God gave it the land. Next. Okay. Now, there are a number of um, texts, as, as Pat Robertson said, there are many texts, actually, that would say that in the Bible. I'm going to quote a few of them, um, and very briefly. This is probably one of the first mentions of uh, a promise in the book of Genesis, uh, chapter, uh, uh, chapter 12. So the Lord appeared to Abram, even before he was renamed Abraham, uh, and said to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord. Uh, I want you to just pay attention to the word offspring because it's going to come up later on. Next. This is another one. Genesis 15. And again, the promise is repeated uh, by the, in the name of God. To your descendants, God says, I will give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river of Euphrates, the land of the Canaanites, and so on and on. I mean, in those days, uh, it was the whole world. You know, they did not know very much more than that. But that's, that's also about the promise. Next. Again, Genesis 17. So you can see um, a number of texts that repeat this type of promise. Now, next. Um, now what is very interesting is that in the Bible, for many years I did not know this, but I, then when I stumbled on it in my readings, I couldn't believe it. That in the Bible, God was promising other pieces of land to other people. <laughs> so, so God tells the ancient Israelites, you know, when you go into the land, avoid dealing with the Edomites because they're your cousins. And it says, I will not, see at the end, underline, I will not give you so much as a foot, foot's length of their land, since I have given Mount Sa'ir to Esau as a possession. So God says, you know, I give you Canaan, but I'm going to give this land to your cousins. Next. Another one. God says to the children of Israel about the Moabites. I'm not going to give you any of their land. When you go to the Moabites places, avoid them. I will not give you any of its land. 
as a possession, since I have given it, as a possession to the descendants of Lot. Next. The same thing with the Ammonites. The same thing. Next. I believe personally that we're dealing with a tribal structure. In the way I understand, in the way I have studied the Bible, I believe there is a movement uh, within some of these texts that reflect a very exclusive understanding of God and of land and of people of God. And um, so these texts reflect the historical period that I call tribal. Although these texts were written, finalized, or edited much later, around the time of the exile, they reflect some traditions, folklore, and legend, legends. So they are in the Bible, but they reflect mental, tribal mentality. And you know, some of us still have a tribal mentality, you know, when I just want everything for myself, for my family, or for my people, and so on. It's a tribal mentality which many people have. And, and this tribal mentality is expressed in some of these texts, but the genius of the Hebrew scriptures, the Tanakh, is that you see a movement that begins with a tribal mentality but moves on and I will show this. Let's, let's look at some of the tribal, tribal mentality expressed in some of these texts. Next. Did I read this? Okay, let's go to numbers. When the Israelites were coming in, um, God tells Moses, God says to Moses, you, when you get in, you shall drive out all the people, all the inhabitants of the land from before you. It's a very tribal, exclusive understanding of God. God is our God, my God. And God says to me, this land is all yours, drive out the people. It's a very tribal, exclusive understanding of God and of the land, you know, for the uh, ancient Israelites. Look at another text. This is from Deuteronomy. And this is even a more stronger. And you know, for, uh, for, ultra, for some ultra-Orthodox Jews, Deuteronomy is very, very important. Book. And in this one it says, when you go in, you shall annihilate them. You shall destroy them all. So you don't only drive them out, you need to kill them. Because if you don't kill them, they give you trouble. Now these texts, and I'm not exaggerating, I can document everything I say, these texts are today used by extremist settlers that the Bible mandates the, the driving away of the Palestinians or the annihilation of the Palestinians. No. This is exclusive understanding of God. It is tribal mentality that is, that is there. Now, as I mentioned, the genius within some of those Hebrew uh, uh, writers that after the exile, beginning with the exile, you begin to really see a stretching of that theology, a stretching of their theology. And there begins, begin, you begin to see a critique of the tribal, a critique of the exclusive. So when you get to Ezekiel after the exile, a prophet, very important prophet in the Old Testament, you begin to see Ezekiel reflecting in a different way. So he does not say drive the people out. He does not say kill them. What does he say? He says, you shall divide the land among you according to the tribes of Israel 
you should allot it as an inheritance for yourselves and for the aliens who live among you. I don't like to be an alien, <laughs> but even if I'm considered an alien, it's an amazing text that basically says, live with the people of the land. Not only live with them, they need to inherit the land just like you do. They shall be to you as citizens of Israel. With you, they shall be allotted an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. In whatever tribe aliens reside, there you shall assign them their inheritance, says the Lord. Amazing text. So you can see the movement from an exclusive understanding of God and of land to a more inclusive understanding, um, a, a critique of the tribal and an embrace of the inclusive. Next. Isaiah, this part of Isaiah after the exile, an amazing development in religious thought. And what I'm emphasizing here, the development of religious thought in the Hebrew scriptures. So what does Isaiah say? I, after the exile, I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. They shall spring up like a green tamarisk, like willows by flowing streams. Isaiah's great theological breakthrough lies in, the, in his realization that God's promise of outpouring the Spirit of God on the people is essentially more important than the possession of the land. Their relationship with God did not depend on being in the land. God without the land, God without the land, is infinitely more important than the land 